Hello everyone. Welcome back to this training on drought monitoring, prediction and projection using NASA Earth System data. This is part 3 of the training and we will focus today on climate change projections and droughts. Last week in part 1, we had an overview of drought monitoring data and tools using Earth observations. Then in part 2, we focused on drought prediction using NASA sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction system. And today, we will focus on climate change projection from global climate models to examine changes projected in temperature and precipitation over the next several decades. There will be a homework that will be posted on 1st of August on the training webpage. It will be due on 15th August and a certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Due date. We'll start with a brief review of part two. We had Dr. Mollard provide an overview of GMAO sub-seasonal to seasonal or S2S predictions. The S2S prediction system uses coupled earth system models and analyzes in conjunction with satellite and in-situ observations to study and predict phenomena that evolve on sub-seasonal to decadal timescales. Some of the examples of S2S data applications include drought forecasting and water resources forecasting, studying dust sources in the U.S., soil moisture, precipitation and temperature prediction for landslide prediction, ecological forecasting and data to drive a pest model. We examined S2S ensemble mean predictions of surface temperature and precipitation anomalies in QGIS and we identified areas of dry and warm conditions uh, that will evolve in next two to three months. Data for users from S to S, they are available upon request and they are distributed on these FTP site. Also, maps of two meter temperature and precipitation monthly anomaly predictions for nine months are available from GMAO atmospheric anomaly site. We had a brief demonstration of this site as well. Finally, specific S2S data can be requested by contacting Dr. Andrea Mollard at this email address. The specific objectives for today are recognize functionality of next GDDP CMIP6 climate projection data set. Next GDDP CMIP6 stands for NASA Earth Exchange Global Daily Downscale Projections for Coupled Model Intercomparison Project Phase 6. We will also access Next GDDP CMIP6 Climate Change Projections to assess long term drought conditions for a region of interest. Overall outline is that we'll start with the background of climate variability and change. Then we will have a brief description of CMIP6 and climate change projections. Then overview of next GDDP CMIP6 system. And then a demonstration of next GDDP projection data access and analysis in Google Earth Engine for drought assessment evolving over several decades. Just a note about uh, the questions. Uh, just as in previous sessions, you can please start putting your questions in the questions box and please feel free to enter your questions as we go and we will try to get to all the questions during the question and answer session after the webinar. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the question and answer document and will be posted on the training website about a week after the training. We'll start with the background of climate variability and change. This is a list of RSET trainings related to topics in climate. They're all online and they provide um, details and definitions of issues related to climate. 
uh, of particular use are the top two uh, climate change monitoring and impacts assessment using NASA Earth observations. And for today's session, this is most relevant that selecting climate change projection sets for mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. So what is climate? It is defined as long-term average characteristics of geophysical quantities, such as temperature, precipitation, and humidity at a regional or global scale. The key here is long-term, so it is at least 30 years or longer. Averaging has to be done over a long period. A similar climate quantity can be defined for uh, land surface parameters such as soil moisture or vegetation index. An example shown here is of temperature. This is from NOAA and this is 30 year mean map of temperature and global mean temperature is 14.9 degrees Celsius. So this is an example of temperature climatology. Next, we define climate variability and change. First, let us look at natural climate variability and change. That they result from natural and not anthropogenic causes. And these causes include ocean atmosphere and land interactions, variability in incoming solar radiation, volcanic activity, and Earth's orbital variations. These causes make climate vary on a variety of time scales. And some examples are El Nino Southern Oscillation with two to six year period or Pacific Decadal Oscillation with say 10 to 12 year oscillation. Here you can see this blue curve, which uh, is schematically showing natural climate variability. One thing to notice here is that there is variability, but it occurs around the same mean. So mean is not changing. If you look at this black curve, which is observed, you can see that there is variability, but it also the mean is changing and there is a trend. And this is because of anthropogenic climate change. So these causes are increasing greenhouse gases and aerosols in the atmosphere due to fossil fuel burning, industrial waste and deforestation. So that's what we mean by natural variability, where mean is not changing, whereas change, climate change is where there is trend and climate mean also is changing. Global climate models, they are designed to capture both natural and anthropogenic climate variability and change. Most global models are grid models shown here. They have horizontal grids as latitude, longitude, and in vertical, um, they are stratified in heights or pressure. And at each grid point, detailed physical processes are modeled. They represent interactions among different components. So these are complex models. They require supercomputers and big data management. Also, it is important to keep in mind that climate models are often designed to capture global signals. So at regional scale, there may be some biases, so they have to be examined. Observations are an important part of model development for initial and boundary conditions and for validation and bias correction. So although models provide a lot of information and predictive capability, uh, they do depend on observations for initial and boundary conditions and for validation. There are more than 100 Earth system models or ECMs from more than 50 modeling institutions. Modeling institutions are constantly improving their models, such as making them higher resolution, improved physics and chemistry and adding more processes. Leading modeling groups have coordinated simulations of climate change scenarios with the auspices of the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project or CMIP, which is currently in phase six. And CMIP program provides important diagnostic and evaluation information for each ECM. Since all ECMs have dif different way of treating physical and chemical processes have different resolutions, their outputs also vary. And so uh, the goal of CMIP is to compare them and come up with and evaluate uh, how they compare with each other. 
Specifically, let's look at CMIP-6 and climate change projections. So the CMIP program is organized by the World Climate Research Program, currently on phase six, as we saw, with the goal to understand past, current, and future climate change occurring in response to natural and anthropogenic causes using multi-model framework. The program was started in 1995 and has evolved uh, in which multiple models participate with the goal of assessing model performance during a historical period that is between 1850 and 2014 and produce future climate projections. All models use common experiments and forcing data and a major goal is to quantify and understand the spread found among the model projections. The schematic here shows basic CMIP uh, program and then the CMIP 6 uh, components here with response to forcing, systematic biases uh, among uh, models and then variability, predictability and future scenarios. And all these are the topics related to that. So now let's look at what is climate prediction and projection and what's the difference. Here is the report that provides detailed information, but basically climate predictions are estimates of future natural conditions. So for example, in the last session, we saw S2S prediction system, which is um, climate prediction system. It started with observed initial conditions and then model was integrated in time. Whereas climate projections are estimates of future climates under various assumptions of future human related activities in socioeconomic and technical developments. So there are assumptions added to the natural conditions. So climate projections have less certainty as they are based on assumptions which may not evolve as expected. So what does modeling and projecting human-driven climate change involve? So the foundation of climate change projections comes from simulations that capture human influence on climate system. It requires radiation physics, atmospheric dynamics, chemistry, oceans, biosphere, cryosphere, and human-driven shifts in emissions and land use. So what that means is a model has to have natural variability in it, that includes all these processes that shown here that changes atmospheric composition as well as land surface. But on top of that, human driven factors have to be included such as industries, uh, urbanization, uh, land use, land change and transportation, etc. Include human driven influence in the model IPCC, which is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they have come up with scenarios and storyline. So scenarios is something that describes a future world through a plausible and internally consistent set of assumptions, potentially including greenhouse gas and aerosol emissions, land use change, socioeconomic development, and technological change. IPCC notes that scenarios are neither predictions nor forecasts, but are used to provide a view of the implications of developments and actions and how to include them in the model. Storyline is a way of making sense of a situation or a series of events through the construction of a set of explanatory elements. Usually it is built on logical or causal reasoning. Storylines can have societal and physical elements, such as the physical implications of a given amount of global warming, potential impact of increasing population, the ramifications of a given policy or new financing being implemented. So all these factors, uh, they can be used to explain uh, a storyline or develop a storyline. So defining some scenarios here, SRES or Special Report on Emission Scenarios, they were developed by IPCC way early in 2000, a third assessment report. Then there were concent uh, Representative Concentration Pathways or RCPs, and now 
they have SSP RCP, which are shared socioeconomic pathways and representative concentration pathways. Um, also, there are uh, adaptation strategies which define global warming levels and nationally determined contributions. So if you look at the figure here from assessment report six, uh, these are surface temperature anomalies from 1750 to today and then projections up to 2100. The numbers are shown here. Uh, darker red, it's a much uh, more global warming, so higher uh, anomalies. Anomalies are calculated with respect to 1850 to 1900 uh, period. Now that's the period used for calculating mean temperature. So you can see that as we get closer to this era, say current, we are in the warming region here. But what we want to see is that uh, different SSPs, which are shared socioeconomic pathways, how they work in adapting so that uh, CO2 emissions are either net zero, they're half, or they're peaking. Depending on that, temperature anomalies will result or global warming will result by 2100. So low, very low SSP 1 to 1 1.9 here, that CO2 is halved um, very soon. In, and then net zero, just after 2050, then the anomalies are lower. If you go above, then if you go here in, in the middle, then half um, is by late in the 21st century. And then if you go up above, there is really no net zero. You don't see anywhere. So this is very high. So these are the scenarios where you have uh, much more global warming. So the global climate models, they use scenarios in which both SSP and RCP are used. So SSPs, they primarily describe socioeconomic development and RCPs describe greenhouse gas concentration. So these can be related and mitigation can create unique combination. Each SSP leads to a given RCP without mitigation, but mitigation can lower RCPs. So initially in CIMIT, earlier IPCC uh, modeling comparison and CIMIT comparison, RCPs were used, different emission scenarios were used. Now uh, shared socioeconomic pathways are used, which include mitigation strategy. So for example, this is by 2100 forcing level in watts per meter square, higher the forcing, more global warming. And so tier one and tier two are just different experiments plans. These are SSP one to SSP five, and these are RCPs. So say here in this region, SSP one is such that mitigation is promoting sustainability and there is low RCPs. As you go up here, uh, there is really fossil fuel development, so there is really not much mitigation going on. Nothing has changed. And then the higher RCPs here, so more emissions, and that results in, in more uh, warming or more forcing by 2100. So with that background, uh, we'll move on to overview of next GDDP, which is a downscaling project, uh, downscaling of global climate model output. Now downscaling, it's an analysis designed to bring global model information to finer resolution, including representation of finer scale features such as land use, mountains and coastlines, and physical processes associated with finer resolution dynamics. Downscaling of global climate model output is necessary for assessing climate impacts on local and regional scale. So most uh, models included in CMIP6, they have low resolution, lower than one degree uh, latitude longitude. And so to resolve local scale phenomena such as tropical storms, uh, hails and tornadoes, uh, dust storms, monsoons, um, heat extremes and droughts, to look at regional or local scale, um, these data are low resolution and so downscaling helps in looking at finer scales. So with that objective of downscaling data, 
Next GDDP was initiated in 2015, initially with CMIP5 project, and now it is updated with CMIP6 with newer climate projections. There are 35 CMIP6 global models included in the downscaling effort, and a number of geophysical parameters are downscaled from most of these models. So in here you can see list of global climate models and these are parameters available from these models. These models are all acronyms and of course these parameters are humidity, relative humidity, specific humidity, precipitation, uh, temperature, uh, temperature maximum and minimum. And uh, these models you can find description in this paper here. Statistical downscaling methodology used in NextGDDP uh, uses a daily variant of the monthly bias correction special desegregation or BCST method. Uh, observational data and reanalysis data at quarter degree scale are used for bias correction. After the bias correction, Special desegregation uh, merges observed historical climatology at each time step with changes uh, from GCM simulations to produce final downscale project. And here is uh, that BCSD code, uh, which is used to generate uh, downscale outputs. It's available in GitHub. So the uh, link is provided here. So you can also download and look at this code for bias correction and uh, special desegregation. The downscale GDDP data are available for the following climate projection scenarios. Historical runs, uh, they provide data for 1850 to 2014. And for these shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs uh, ranging from 1.26 to 5.85, um, the data are available uh, at daily time scale with quarter degree latitude longitude special resolution and their quality checked. Now looking at these different projections, we talked, uh, talked about these SSPs earlier, but SSP1 has low challenges for mitigation. That means it, it's resource efficient and uh, for adaptation also there is rapid development in technology, but perhaps green technology. And as you go down, SSP5 is the high challenges for mitigation and low for adaptation. Uh, so it's there is rapid development, uh, but it is dependent on um, fossil fuels. So uh, bottom line is that here uh, the resulting global warming would be lower about 1.8 degrees Celsius. There is a range, uh, but that would be the maximum. And here it would be greater than 5, about 5.6 degrees Celsius or so warming uh, by 2100. So now how to select climate change projections? Um, so a number of factors have to be considered as listed here. First of all, understand the differing needs of mitigation, adaptation, and risk management applications. Uh, then recognize the main components and distinguishing factors of climate projection sets. Recognize the benefits and trade-offs of different climate projection sets and versions. And consider selection of the best climate projection set for various application needs. Just to note here, our set does not recommend any particular model or scenario for climate change, but there is a general guideline that we provide to access and analyze GCM data to facilitate your efforts in gauging climate change in the region of your own interest. And here is the RSA training I mentioned earlier as information about selecting climate change projections. There are additional factors to be considered when selecting climate change projections. Uh, it also depends on application and decision-making needs of a particular region of interest. So for a number of applications shown here, say from human health, agricultural, all the way to energy resources, different application ready parameters are required, uh, listed here. And uh, local and regional physical and socioeconomic conditions also matter in decision making. So interacting with climate scientists in that region, they, they can help users in deciding 
which model projection, which model and which model projections are best for use, um, including spatial and temporal resolutions, what kind of bias corrections are done. So these factors can also help in deciding uh, which climate projection to choose. Once you choose a climate change projection, then you can download or access the data from Amazon Web Service. That's where they are available. So here is the information about resources on AWS. Uh, the data are in NetCDF format. Uh, resource type is S3 bucket, and this is the Amazon resource name. Licensing information is given here in this document. The link is provided. An important thing to know here is that um, as of September 2022, all next GDDP CMIP 6 outputs are made available under a blanket Creative Commons Zero license. These data are managed by NASA and you can contact support at nccs.nasa.gov for more information or if you have any questions. Here is how to cite this data if you download and use. And there are also usage examples, tools, and applications uh, at this next GDDP CMIP6 dashboard by NASA. And there are publications with more information. There's a subset of data available from AWS. And that that's there are two models, GFDL, which is a, it's a NOAA global climate model, and GIS, that's a NASA global climate model. Two scenarios are available, SSP245 and SSP585. And the data are available in cloud-optimized GeoTIFF formats. The data are divided into three uh, sub-products, daily, so source data with daily timestamps, monthly, so these are monthly aggregation across both models, and crossing, it's a single data product for each SSP, indicating the number of years until the average daily temperature crosses two degree limit from the Paris Agreement at each position on Earth. So the, this subset also can be used and available from AWS, the information can be found here. These data are also available from Google Earth Engine. So what we are going to do is next have a demonstration of how to access these data easily in GEE and also analyze to look at um, drought conditions evolving over next several decades. So we'll start with the demonstration. Let us start with this demonstration of analysis of next GDDP climate change production data using Google Earth Engine. As you know from part one, Google Earth Engine is a cloud-based platform and uses JavaScript for coding and for data analysis. So in this demonstration, we have provided a JavaScript code and we are going to walk through it block by block to see how to access and analyze next GDDP data. The objective is that we will examine near surface temperature and precipitation as drought indicators as we find in GDDP CMIP6 models and we will select the data for the area of interest and see how temperatures and precipitation evolve over the 21st century. In the training webpage, you will find uh, the exercise for today, which is the hands-on exercise where you can use this code and examine GDDP data. So you can go there and click on the link right now and you will be able to access the code and follow along. You will need to have an account on Google Earth Engine to run this JavaScript code. To access next GDDP data on GEE, we need to find out information about how to access it. And for that, we first go to earthengine.google.com, go to datasets, 
and search for GDDP CMIP6. So this is next GDDP CMIP6. Once you click on that, you will find out how to access the data in the sense that this is the name of the image collection in Google Earth Engine, and this is the string that you will have to use to access the data. It also tells you what are the uh, data set availability, uh, who, who's the provider, and different tags are given here. More importantly, that is description of the data set, and the links are available for the paper. We saw that in our slides also. Uh, there, there are bands given here. So in bands, you will find all the parameters available in the GDDP models, units of these parameters, minimum and maximum values, and description. So we want to look at surface temperature and precipitation. So TAS is the daily near surface air temperature given in Kelvin. So we need to know that string name. Also, we need to know precipitation or PR which is in kilograms per meter square per second. It's the daily mean precipitation. There are also other parameters such as relative humidity uh, and specific humidity near surface. Um, there are radiation components uh, and there is surface winds also available and then daily minimum and maximum temperature. Uh, for example, we are going to focus on TAS and PR, but you can also look at other parameters by um, choosing by these strings. Next, we see image properties. In image properties, you will find all the models available in this data set. So GDDP, as we know, CMIP6 has um, about 35 uh, models or so participating, and GDDP downscales uh, these model data. The models which are included in this GEE dataset are given here in different strings. Again, we saw the list of these uh, models in presentation slide, and the reference given in there has description about each of uh, these models. But what we are going to do is focus on one of these models, and that is GISS or GIS. This is NASA Global Climate Model. So we need to know this string uh, GISS E2-E2-1-G. So we have picked that. There are other models too. GFTL is a NOAA model. MIROC is a Japanese model. Um, Headley Center model are UK model. And you can get more information about it from the reference that we saw in, in the slides earlier. Also, another piece of information is about scenario. These are SSPs, um, shared socioeconomic pathways that we talked about earlier. So in this data set, historical data are available, historical model runs are available. SSP 245 and SSP 585 are available. So this is the information we need to know uh, before we can select and analyze GDDP data. So going back to our code now, the model outputs are available for two scenarios, SSP 245 and 585 as we saw. And what that means is SSP 245 is the middle pathway of future greenhouse emission, projecting radiative forcing of 4.5 watts per meter square by 2100. Whereas 585, as we saw earlier, has additional radiative forcing of 8.5 watts per meter square by the year 2100. So this is the upper boundary of the uh, range of scenarios uh, we saw earlier. Now for this demonstration, what we have done is we have selected one model and we're going to select one scenario. So what we will see is how to select a model from GDDP model ensemble that we saw in the image properties, how to pick a scenario, uh, how to select parameters, temperature and precipitation. Um, what we will do is we'll collect daily global data for 2020, 2050 and 2100. We'll look at um, these three years, just one is 30 year apart and an eight year apart. So 
uh, we just to see how things are changing uh, over the century. Um, then we'll clip the global data to the country of our interest and we'll define uh, the country in a variable AOI later as we will see, or area of interest. Uh, we'll find annual mean uh, of near surface temperature and precipitation for the three years that we have picked. Then uh, we will uh, map these parameters for AOI and we will also find differences. So how temperature differs between 50 and 20 and 2100 and 2020, so we'll map those as well. And finally, we will examine annual mean near surface temperature. How, what is the trend? How warming is occurring over the AOI we pick uh, between 2020 and 2100? So that's the um, exercise. So now this segment talks about how to select a country, and for that, uh, we've used the Food and Agricultural Organization uh, FAO's Global Administrative Unit Layers, or GAUL, and Sean McCartney demonstrated this in part one as well. But we have imported this um, GAUL levels. So in here, level zero is the country level shapefile. Um, so all the countries in the world are included in here. If you go to level one, these are sub-regions. What we, we have defined is this as countries and this is a sub-region. So if you pick level zero, it will be one country you can pick. If you have level one, you can have uh, states within the country. You can pick a particular state as well. For this demonstration, we will uh, use level zero. And so the variable we will use is countries here. And we have already imported this data. And this is the block that explains all that. Now, this segment defines all the variables used in the subsequent code. Um, when you go through the exercise, you can look at this for the definition of variables. What we are going to do is we'll define each variable as we come across it as we work through the code. So starting with our analysis now, for the demonstration purpose, as an example, I've picked country of Ethiopia. And the reason for that is that if you go to this World Atlas site, uh, according to their uh, projection by 2050, a large part of Earth would uh, have uh, really deficit of water and drought-like condition, but the top 10 countries, uh, most of them in Africa and Asia, um, they have been identified as most affected countries by drought. And they, like Morocco, Uganda, Somalia, Iran, Pakistan, China, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Sudan, and Ethiopia. So based on this report, for this demonstration, I'm focusing on Ethiopia. So here we are picking, uh, defining a variable AOI and specifying the country of our interest, which is Ethiopia in this case. When you want to uh, choose country of your own interest, all you have to do is replace this name by the country of your interest. So this AOI will define that. We define a variable my AOI. What that does is takes this countries. Um, feature connection of GEO, GAUL that we imported takes that and filters uh, AOI and assigns that shape file um, for the um, country that we picked. This map.center object it focuses the map on the region of, that we picked. So in this case, it's a, my AOI, and this is the zoom factor. Uh, and so one is the whole earth and 25 is the small segment. So we are picking a uh, zoom level of five and map.add layer uh, adds the shape file uh, to the map pane. And when you run this code, it shows up here as an example. We did that already. So you can see that Ethiopia shape file is showing. Uh, after that. So this is what we have picked for the analysis. 
Alternatively, you can, if you have another region of your interest uh, and you have a shape file, you can upload it to this code. So you go to this left window and go to assets, new, and here you can upload. So you can select shape file or CSV file, which you may already have on your computer. Uh, for a specific region of your interest, you can upload that and then you will have to uh, import as AOI. Um, that is very important. Yeah. Or you can even go to this map pane and you can draw a polygon or a square in any area of your interest. I'm just showing an example. So you create this geometry uh, and go to this view symbol and you have to name this as AI um, and, then in, and then say OK to import it. Uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to delete that. Just use the Ethiopia uh, as our country of interest. But you can have a variety of way of choosing your own region. Next, we start working with the GDDP data. First, we start with the Google Earth Engine image collection NASA slash GDDP CMIP6 that we saw earlier. Uh, from that, we are filtering the data for a particular model that is NASA GIS. Uh, one scenario SSP 245 and for the date range 2020, uh, January uh, 1st, 2020 to December 31st, 2100. So we define a variable data set. We start with the global daily image collection in which all the parameters are there, all the models are there, and all the scenarios are there. From that, we are filtering by date first, then by model this, and by scenario SSP245. So data set will have global uh, data, but just one model, one scenario, and still it has multiple parameters. Here we have a print statement for data set, and it prints first 120 elements from the image collection. But that is when you have a print statement here, you will see that it prints here in this console window. So, so for data set, it's an image collection and it tells you what's in there. So this is the first uh, day here. This is uh, January 1st, 2020, and then it has all the variables. So now what we're going to do is go to this segment. Now we are focusing on three years for the demonstration purpose. You can do this for many all the years. But let's see, we'll start with 2020, 2050, and 2021. So we'll select parameter TAS, which is the surface air temperature as we saw earlier. And we're going to click that to the Ethiopia shape file. So we define a variable ART, surface air temperature. But take that data set image collection, uh, which has all the parameters. From that, we just surface air temperature and this is still global data so now we clip it to our area of interest that is Ethiopia so we define a new variable air temperature regional or air T underscore ridge uh, which uh, takes that air T and clips to my AOI again the print statement is just for checking on the data set so now we have all uh, 2020 to 2100, all the years are there. By picking these three years, for each year, we want to make annual mean temperature map. So we'll start with year 2020 and start and end date these um, statement. They just pick one year. So daily data are picked for one year and a new variable TYY is defined, which takes that surface air temperature regional, 
for Ethiopia that we created up here. And filter filters it just for one year. And in so that's the filter data for one year. And T2020 now we are finding mean. So this reduce reducer mean takes all the daily data for 2020 and finds mean. And so we have one map for the air temperature for T2020. So this is how we find annual mean. And then these are the print statements again, just to check that uh, our calculations are correct or code is correct. And you can go through this in the console window to see exactly it is as you expect. So now we are repeating the same steps for 2050. So at the end, we have T2050 and 2100. So we have uh, T2100. So we have three years, annual mean temperature. Now we are looking at differences between uh, temperatures, surface air temperatures. So here we define TDF 2050 minus 2020, which takes annual mean surface air temperature for 2050 and subtracts annual mean surface temperature for 2020. And this is similarly for 2100. So now we have differences in temperature with respect to 2020. So how far it will be in 2050 and, how, and then 2100. So we have three years of data, annual mean, and then two differences. And in the next, next segment, we are visualizing all these parameters. And we can um, specify this is the variable we have defined here just for visualization, minimum and maximum temperature range in Kelvin. And we have defined color palette with colors here. Um, and for the difference, this is the palette we uh, use. It is minus 0.7 to 2. These were chosen somewhat randomly or by looking at the map and we'll go through that uh, procedure to do that. Uh, then we plot, actual plotting is done here. So map dot add layer for the 2020, 50 and the 2100. And then these two differences, 2050 minus 2020 and um, 2100 minus 2020. So at the end of this whole segment, we have temperature analysis. The analysis for precipitation, uh, we follow the same procedure as we did for um, surface air temperature. So we start with the data set image collection with all the parameters and we select PR from that. And so we have global precipitation data, uh, just uh, no other parameter but PR for one model is and one scenario RCP245. Then we clip it to my AOI, which is Ethiopia. So now from global data, we have regional data of precipitation. Again, this is all years, 2020 to 2100. Also note that here we are defining a constant, which is um, seconds per day uh, in the uh, GDDP data set, precipitation is given in the units of kilograms per meter square per second, uh, which is equivalent to millimeters per second. And if you recall, in last week S2S prediction uh, QGIS analysis, we did unit conversion from kilograms per meter square per second to millimeter per day. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're taking the precipitation value and then multiplying by this constant. So now we are going to find annual mean rain rate for 2020, just as we did for temperature. So we'll start with the start date and end date, and we'll find uh, 
image collection in which we have daily data just for 2020 for precipitation. And then this reducer mean that then provides mean for uh, that year. So here we have PR 2020 annual mean and we're multiplying to convert the unit. And these are just the print statements like before, just to check the data. We do exactly the same uh, procedure and get annual mean rain rate for 2050 and annual mean rain rate for 2100. Similar to the surface air temperature, now we are finding differences uh, in precipitation uh, between 2050 and 2020 and 2100 and 2020. So these are the variables defined and the subtraction done here using the annual mean precipitation. Now we are defining visualization parameters here for the maps. This is for the precipitation and this is for the precipitation differences. And here actual plotting is done in map.add layer. And so we are plotting mean precipitation as well as the differences. And when we run, we get all these maps. So let's first look at the maps that we have, and then we can proceed further. That we have all the layers are generated. We we'll start with air temperature. So this is 2020 air surface air temperature. And if you click on this view, uh, you will be able to see the, the colors here and the range. Uh, this is what we had specified, but what we can do is go to custom and stretch 100%. And then it will come back with exact values and now you can apply it. So this is the actual range now. Now, if you, if you want to make this uh, permanent, you can go back to the code and change mean and max values, but we are doing this just through visualization. Uh, so let's not do that. We'll just check the numbers here. Here you we have a hot, quite warm region where it's yellow and red and green and the blue and purple and dark blue. They are the colder parts. So this is more 280-ish and this is about 300. So that's how it is. Uh, you can look at air temperature for 2050 and 2100, and then let's look at differences as well. We can do the same thing. Let's uh, go to 2100 um, and do the same thing and apply, and then it should come back with the range. So it's working on it. So you can see that the values have gone higher. In 2020, it was 20, 280 to 305. It's 282 to 307. And clearly, we can see that a larger part of the countries, they are warmer now in 2100 compared to 2020. And you can see that in the... Uh, Let's see, difference, this is 2100 minus 2022. And here, uh, we can again do the same thing, apply. You should be able to see the numbers. So here, everywhere, and uh, differences are positive. Uh, implying that uh, 2100 uh, has warmer temperature everywhere uh, compared to 2020. So obviously there is warming going on. So this is temperature map. And let's quickly look at precipitation before we look at long-term trend in temperatures. So looking at the precipitation now, uh, this is precipitation in 2020.
and we can check the numbers here so it's 0 0.1624 uh, millimeters per day and in the western part of the country there is more rain than in the eastern and southern part uh, that's the pattern we see and if we look at 2021 precipitation it also shows pretty much the same pattern if you look at the difference between 2100 and 2020 precipitation there is interesting pattern uh, in case of temperature, uh, there was uniformly increase in temperature in 2100, but in precipitation, it looks like there are regional patterns. There are places where 2100 has more rainfall uh, than 2020, and then there are places where 2100 has less. So local processes may be playing role. Uh, we are we are actually just looking at one model and one projection. Uh, ideally, we should be looking at uh, many models and comparing the patterns and magnitude um, and taking ensemble mean of all models, uh, perhaps. So uh, we'll conclude our special analysis here. And last part we will be looking at is uh, temperature trend in, in the country between 2020 and 2100. From our temperature analysis, we do see that uh, temperatures uh, are getting warmer between 2020 and 2100 over the entire country of Ethiopia. And so here we are looking at temperature trend between 2020 and 2100. Uh, so we first find annual mean for um, each year and then we find mean over Ethiopia. So we have annual mean, country mean temperature uh, for 81 years, and we are going to plot that as a time series. So in this segment, we are just coming up with a list of years. And if you, in, in the print statement, you can check uh, that this is 2020, 21, 22, so it, uh, there are 81 years from 2020 to 2100 and so for that list now we are finding um, annual mean from this ART so this is global surface air temperature we calculated or extracted above from the GDDP uh, collection so we have this T annual image collection which is temporal mean uh, for each year in this list date. So for each year, we have a map over Ethiopia with annual mean temperature. It's very similar to what we did for individual years like 2020 and 2050, 2100. This will be for each year now between 2020 and 2021. Once we have that, here we are now taking special mean over the entire country. So we'll start with um, the, that T annual image collection and we average, we find mean over my AOI, that is Ethiopia. Scale here is 25,000. So this is in meter. Since the resolution of uh, GDDP data is 25 kilometer, the scale here is 25,000 uh, meters equivalent to 25 kilometers. And once we find this special mean, then we have for each year, we have one number that is country average temperature, annual average temperature. And so that's what we are plotting here. So when we print time series, we get a chart here um, in console and let's move down and here is the arrow to make it big so this is uh, from model GIS so GIS temperature uh, 296 to 301 Kelvin here are the years and clearly you can see that there is a 
trend between 2020 and 2100 you do see variability but there is clearly a trend you can also download this as csv file and do further analysis in excel if you like suppose you want to fit a line or actually want to find slope and intercept you can do that too finally this segment shows an example of how to export uh, image or data to google drive an example we use t2050 that is uh, the annual mean surface air temperature that uh, we have calculated above um, for exporting this to drive you have to use these lines to prepare the data and when you run the script uh, in the, this window on the right hand side you will see option tasks when you click on that you will see this unsubmitted task that corresponds to the data prepared here. You click run here, uh, check everything for initiating image export. Um, you can keep the file format as GeoTIFF if you want to do further spatial analysis with GIS or other software and then run it. Uh, click here to run and then the uh, export to Google Drive starts. So depending on the size of the image and data, it may take a while to export it to Google Drive, but this is, this is the way to do it. This is just an example. So this concludes our demonstration for today. And we just want to note that every effort is made to ensure the code is free of errors, but there is no warranty for the maps and their features uh, to be either specially or temporally accurate or fit for a particular use. This code is provided without any warranty of any kind whatsoever, either express or implied. So with that, we summarize today's session. Uh, we learned that climate is the long-term mean of characteristics of geophysical parameters. By long-term, it means 30 years or longer. Climate variability and change, uh, they are due to both natural and anthropogenic causes. Natural causes include variations in solar radiation, Earth's orbital variations, and ocean atmosphere land interactions. And anthropogenic causes include increase in greenhouse gases and aerosols due to industries, transportation, and land use change. Global climate models capture both natural and anthropogenic climate variability and change. And CMIP5 allows intercomparison of model outputs to understand differences among them. CMIP is now in phase six. Next, GDDP uses statistical methodology to downscale outputs for five different climate projections of several CMIP6 models at quarter degree latitude, longitude spatial resolution, and daily temporal resolution. Next, GDDP data are available from Amazon Web Service, and they're also available from GEE, as we saw in the demonstration. As an example, Next, GDDP surface air temperature and precipitation changes over Ethiopia were examined between 2020 and 2100 in GEE. We used one model, NASA GIS, and one projection, SSP245. Our last training session will be on Thursday, um, on 1st of August. This will be part four, and that will be on overview of regional tools to facilitate drought monitoring and assessment. We will have demonstration of Navajo Nation Drought Severity Evaluation Tool or BSAT and Sustainable Forest Management and Information System or SFMS. Both these tools uh, are regional tools and uh, with some effort can be customized for um, other regions. There will be homework posted on our website on 1st of August and answer must be submitted by Google Forms. The homework will be due on 15th of August. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all four live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. Then the certificate will be awarded to you by email approximately two months after the uh, training is over. 
so with that um, we have some time now for you to work on the exercise you can take the uh, google earth engine code the link is given to you and you have uh, uh, instruction about where to change uh, the region of your interest and then run the code and you will get images and time series just as we saw for ethiopia so uh, we will stay online and you can work uh, on the exercise So question one is, how do you calculate the temperature in 1750? So uh, there, are, there are paleoclimate data and past data reconstruction from uh, proxies, uh, such as tree rings, sometimes air bubbles ca caught in ice layers. Uh, these are used uh, for temperature. They're calibrated with temperature. So that's paleoclimate proxies are used. Question two, um, just one moment, please. I want to make sure. Okay, so question two. Is there a glossary available for these abbreviations and terminologies? So uh, we've tried to define um, most acronyms, uh, but you for IPCC, specifically climate-related glossary, uh, you can use this IPCC document that the link, link is provided. Question three around slide 22, next GDTP symmetrics. Can this data be used to calculate well, wet bulb temperature? Um, I know there are a lot of uncertainties with the results as it's a model. Uh, so the answer is yes, you can estimate wet bulb temperature because uh, in GDDP you have both like relative humidity, specific humidity are there and winds are there as well. So you should be able to calculate wet bulb, well, wet bulb temperature. Question four. Is climate change impact uniform across the globe or does it um, intensity, its intensity varies from the North Pole to the South Pole? Uh, so yes, it, it, it varies uh, almost everywhere. Uh, it, it depends on the local processes and regional processes. So that's why downscale models are preferable than global model uh, with um, higher resolu special resolution, but yes, Climate change impact is not uniform everywhere, no. Question five, is downscaling only done in the temporal component and not in special one? Will there be downscaling below one kilometer square? So currently, um, I'm not aware of anything where downscaling is at that high resolution, like one kilometer square or less. Uh, if you look at CMIP6 models, most of them have low resolution. It's like 100 kilometer to 250 kilometer uh, resolution. So uh, GDDP provides data at 25 kilometer square. So that's at least uh, a m m higher resolution than uh, most global climate model have. Um, if you want very high resolution uh, downscaling, you have to have observations at that scale too, to first of all, develop downscaling coefficients and also for bias correction and everything. So I believe that's a very high resolution. What people do is that they take downscale data and then use as forcing to uh, say cloud resolving or very, very high resolution models, depending on the application. Question six, doesn't next, uh, CMIP6 also use CDF to bias correct. Uh, why are both correction methods used and what is the specific purpose of each? So I, spec I, uh, I don't think I can answer this in detail. We'll try to find out, but what I know is that CMIP6 has all the models, they do use bias correction uh, in CDF way, 
But for GDDP, which is you are downscaling at higher resolution, so further bias correction has has to be done uh, at that resolution. And so, yes, um, the BCSD is used in GDDP. The next GDDP semi-plex model can be used worldwide in latitude range or continent. Uh, they, these are global models, so yes, they can be used uh, worldwide. This is question seven. Question eight, is the result code just showing the map or can we get a CSV file for daily temperature or precipitation in these years of scenarios? Uh, yes, you can definitely download CSV files. Um, if you are looking at a big region and you are looking at maps, daily maps, uh, maybe they, there will be huge files for CSV. Maybe you can download as GT, GOT file on your Google Drive and convert them to CSV if you like. Uh, time series, as you saw, there is a way you can download a CSV file. Question nine, are there any examples or case studies whereby this analysis was used for decision-making by an organization or a country? So this is really a very good question. Uh, we do not have specific answer for that this country or this organization has used for decision making. Uh, the, these projections are used as a guideline by most uh, organizations and um, in countries. Now, uh, we will find out if we have any specific examples uh, what um, you do here is that, say, insurance companies, when uh, real estate companies, they do look at these projections uh, when uh, they are thinking of future where they're going to build, um, say, property or buildings, or what kind of projections are there. Um, I don't know if that's the only factor for decision making, but uh, these companies do look at how climate might change in a few years at a given location. But I do not have any specific um, organization or country that I can quote here. Uh, question 10, is the GEE data bias corrected um, or downscaled for further analysis? So it, what you mean GDDP data or the one day data are in GEE, but it's the same, so yes. GDDP data, they are bias corrected. Um, I would say that if you have observations in the region of your interest, you can compare uh, with observations and see how good, which model works in your region. You can, are there biases left or? So question 11, can you provide training material to download the GRACE data for the new platform, from the new platform, uh, downscale the data at uh, quart quarter degree and compute groundwater storage anomaly. So I will provide you a link of uh, GLDAS model. I'm going to make a note here. Uh, they assimilate GRACE data and then they, uh, the model has higher resolution than the original GRACE data. Uh, I'll, I'll be sure to post this answer once I have the information. Can you provide, uh, this is question 12, can you provide the code for Celsius degree, please? So yes, I think we can do that. You can just add one line, subtract 273 from everywhere. Um, I think you can modify the code. Uh, when you are looking at the differences, they are equivalent to Celsius. Um, but when you're looking at temperature, they're in Kelvin, and um, we, we can perhaps add a, a line of code there. Question 13, how can we get the final product of the precipitation scenario in net CDF? Um, so I, the, you can go to the original data set um, and from Amazon Web Service, they are in NetCDF uh, format. If you are going to GEE, 
uh, best thing is to save as GeoTIFF and then convert to NetCDF uh, using Python or GDAL. Um, I'm not sure whether you will be able to download NetCDF from GEE. I will have to check on that. Question 14, how is data accuracy ensured in Earth Engine scenario modeling? Or are calibration procedures implemented in Earth Engine to enhance the re reliability of scenario outputs? So Earth Engine is actually not adding anything. It's just taking the data and making it available through the cloud platform. So whatever the original data are, they are in Earth Engine. So there is no additional calibration procedures used in GE. Question 15, how can I apply the code to calculate environmental variables such as NDVI, albedo, and evapotranspiration? Uh, so uh, I am not sure um, whether this is specifically related to modeling or you're asking in general. Um, we had uh, Sean McCartney demonstrated uh, in session one. Uh, there are, so code is available for NDVI calculations, uh, albedo and evapotranspiration, uh, these products are available. Um, so I think we need uh, some spec more specific question here about calculating environmental variables. Question 16, are there any training resources available on soil moisture prediction estimation? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I think our coordinators have provided links to our set soil moisture um, trainings. Question seven, could you tell me how Break number index in JavaScript, I mean, after line one and line two, the number of line will restart again. Uh, tell me how break number. I, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, that line will start, restart again. Uh, I, I think I'm, not familiar with that and uh, we'll check with people who are in uh, who are experts in javascript question 18 can we select more than one model and get an ensemble to get more accurate results uh, yes definitely i think ensemble mean has less inaccuracy uh, but as i explained earlier it's also important to look at more models individually also, maybe for some region, a particular model may be, um, they have less bias or you know, can be used. But yes, ensemble mean is, is, that's what people use mostly. So question 19, can you explain why the two bias correction methods, both CDF and BCST are used? I think we did uh, go through that before, uh, CDF, CMIP6 models they use CDF, but when you are downscaling, uh, then again you have to consider biases because um, just to see you how that's why BCSD is used. Question 20 How do you downscale the CMIP6 data using ground data? So that is a whole. Huh, that, that's not a simple answer. We can provide this. It's an area of research and people use uh, different methodology uh, using ground data to do uh, downscaling. And that, that BCSD, uh, if you look at the code um, where you are doing uh, special uh, desegregation, you, so you can look into that, but it's a complex, uh, there are many, many me methods used for downscaling.
question 21 these models have some area preferences or are they good for every part of the world um, they they have area preferences in the in the sense that um, some if they, some model works better in some area some other model works better in some other area that is possible and um, so that they have tried to correct biases and make them as best as they can depending on a lot of factors uh, but uh, whether they are good uniformly everywhere that is a it's in question that has to be checked okay question uh 22 it's pretty much the same as before uh at gddp in gee is that uh based on both bcst and cdf so gee it just takes GDDP data and puts in their own cloud platform. There is no further analysis done on GEE for bias correction. Question 23, how can I unite two countries that share a border on GEE? Um, you can draw a polygon. That's one way to do it, or covering both the countries, or you can define a shape file where you can merge shape file, uh, two country shape file, and use as one. Uh, how can I, uh, question 24, how can I use this code to compute the SPEI index? So this code cannot use, be used as is to calculate SPEI index, uh, you have to add that segment. Uh, Question 25, how do you run the code using all available models? So um, you have to go back and extract data from each model with the string. Um, there is a way to, uh, to just get all the model. That means if you don't specify that model, then all the models are used. But if you, in GEE, uh, you will get an error because uh, daily data for all the models for a particular parameter is a huge file. So you, mo you know, I, I've tried that. If you have limited period or a much smaller domain, then you just don't specify any model and you will get all the models in there. So data from all the models will be available at that point. So either you can do sequentially model by model, but if you don't specify that um, model parameter, then all the models are used. You'll get data from all the models. You will have, it, it, it only gets tricky if your region is very big and if you're getting a lot of parameters because these are daily data for 81 years. Question 26, is it possible to save the results in NetCDF files locally? Um, so I, I can, I will look into that, but um, if you go to the, where, how you can export files to, um, to, to Google Earth, Google Drive, then you, it, they are, they're saved as, maps are saved as GeoTIFF data format. And then you can convert to NetCDF. But there may be a code snippet which does that, and we'll try and look for that. Question 27, how can I save the modified GEE code? So on top where you are running, uh, next to that, there is a save button. And there you can just click on save and it, it is saved. So on the top menu bar where you actually go and click run, next to it you will see um, save button. Uh, 
So we do have a few minutes. If you have more questions. So we hope to see you on, in our last session on Thursday, on 1st of August at the same time. Uh, we will have demonstration of regional uh, models. Uh, question 28 is coming up. It says, when I execute the code using profiler, the entire code run, can I execute a part of code? So yes, you can uh, comment out the sections and if you go to the code, let me tell you the lines. If you just go on top of the code provided to you, uh, line three has a slash and a, a, so a star, right? If that starts a comment block, and then if you go down to line 75, that is star and, and slash. So that ends that comment block. So if you want to not execute certain parts, you can have slash star at the top and after that uh, code section have star slash. So that is commented out and not executed. Yeah, question 29, I'm receiving an error for the time series chart response size exceeds limit. Uh, that I did say that earlier that depending on the the country size uh, you are using, uh, this is happening. So try to reduce um, your special domain. So if you're looking at a country like US or India or Brazil, uh, or China or any big countries or Australia, it, the whole country you will not be able to fit um, in, in that data set um, image collection because it has, to start with, it needs global daily data for like a big country and number of parameters. So uh, we will look into that though, if there is any way right away to, um, filter first by space, spatial domain and go, but I, it has given me trouble too. So I'll look into that, but the uh, best thing is to just uh, have smaller pieces and work with that. Question 30, how can these scenarios be used for a small area of interest such as a, as a country or a sub basin? So uh, you create your own shape file and upload that, that as area of interest for a smaller region or a part of a county or a sub-basin. That is the best, more accurate way of doing it. Or you can zoom into the uh, map pane and define your own geometry. We saw that, you know, in, in, if you go to the map pane on the left hand side, you will see several ways like there's a polygon, there's a square that you can draw so that you can approximate the county map or river basin that way.
I see question thirty one. <clears throat> Yeah, this is a this is the question. We are limited ultimately by the resolution. How much higher can the resolution of CMIP six go <clears throat> before we should use Landsat or Sentinel? I I think uh, at this point, uh, unless you have very high resolution observations, um, there is I mean you can increase resolution, but it may be very noisy. <clears throat> so I think that's uh, that's the area of research. So we are all at the end of this session today. <clears throat> so thank you for attending uh, today's session. And we also want to thank our RSET team uh, for helping with everything. Our coordinator, Natasha Johnson Griffin and Sarah Kashel, Selvin Hudson Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, Brock Levins and uh, Susan Monty, they've all helped uh, in coordinating this training. <clears throat> Special thanks to Natasha and Sarah for making everything available online. And uh, all our uh, material will be posted on the training page, including question and answer document. And you have our set web page link there. On behalf of all the RSET team, my, including my colleague Sean McCartney, all the coordinators, I really want to thank you for attending today's session. And we hope to see you on Thursday in our concluding session. <clears throat>